Hi, this is Smiley from The Alarm. And you're listening to the New Wave Music Podcast. Welcome back to the New Wave Music Podcast. Today we're joined by the legendary guitarist James Stevenson. James is currently the guitarist for The Alarm. And Gene loves Jezebel. For our U.S. listeners, that'd be Jay Aston's Gene Loves Jezebel. Welcome, James. It's an honor to have you on the show. Well, I don't know if I'm a legend, but it's very nice. <laughs> well, uh, you are. <laughs> so James, you have a new solo album. It came out last year called The Other Side of the World, and we're going to yeah. be talking to you about that. Okay. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we, uh, just as a little preface here, we met James uh, about the middle of May and uh, talked to him a little bit. And, yeah, we're, we're really thrilled to have you on the show. So, James, you're, you're aware of this. Uh, a journalist once joked that you've been in 72% of the bands out there, and the list is long. I mean, we're talking about Generation X, The Cult, the band Chelsea, Holy Holy, where you worked with legendary producer Tony Visconti and Glenn Gregory of Heaven 17, and then a sort of punk supergroup International Swingers with Clem Burke uh, of Blondie and Glenn Matlock of the Sex Pistols. And that's not to mention, just like Steve said, that you're, you're the guitarist for Gene Loves Jezebel and The Alarm. You are well sought out. Yeah, that was Mick Mercer. He's a quite a well-known British journalist. That He was reviewing an Alarm album, and it said... And guitarist James Stevenson, and then in brackets, it has who has played in 72% of all known bands. <laughs> <laughs> now, on my personal pick, it has 72%, and I don't explain what it means, so people are always asking me. Yeah, I read that in an article, too, that you have that on your pick. Um, yeah. Did I miss any bands that you've been working with in the past? Or? Um no, not bands. I mean, I've, you know, I've played on a lot of records when, that people have asked me to play on, but, you know. Well, and so you were the tu- the touring guitarist with both Generation X and The Cult. How was it working with Billy Idol and Ian Asbury? Oh, my God. Well, I mean, singers are a whole other species, aren't they? <laughs> As you know. <laughs> um, yeah, they are. I mean, you know, they're... I mean, they're both great singers in their own in their own right and their their own way. I mean, Billy is a very uh, uh, Billy is a very very charismatic guy. I used to get on really well with Billy. I've sort of kind of lost touch with him now. And um, Ian is just you know, I mean, he's you know, he's a crazy guy. He's funny. <laughs> he, you know, he he he's just his own person completely. I can remember the first time when I was um, playing with him in ninety four ninety five. And uh, he used to come over to my guitar tech and take all his rings and earrings and everything off and just say, I'm going in. And then he would take a running dive into the audience and you'd see him oh. getting lost around, you know, like a hundred yards away. And then like, when I was doing it in 2014, you know, Ian's got this thing with a tambourine that's really cool, the way he plays it and stuff. And um, anyway, his, one of the techs threw him like a tambourine. He was going to catch it and start playing it. But I just realised before he even did it, he was going to like head it like a soccer ball. And of course, they've got all those little metal discs. So he headed it and it just split his head open. Oh, and it, my. There's pictures on YouTube. He was, I think it was in San Diego and he was just like covered in blood. But And he just oh. like carried on like, you know, looking like some kind of gremlin or something just covered in blood. So, how, did you, how did you end up... Um becoming or going on tour with those two bands what did they just need somebody extra or well no in i mean you know generation x uh derwood the guitarist had left the band so oh. they'd recorded their new album which is called kiss me deadly and you know i was part of that punk scene and everyone knew everybody and you know they asked me if i wanted to do it 
Um, so I kind of went down and auditioned, really. And then, literally, I didn't hear anything for about th- three months. And then Tony James, the bass player, called me up and said, um, do you still want to be in Gen X? You know, and I was like, yes. Oh, uh, yes. And- <laughs> <laughs> that was that one. And then the cult, I mean, Billy, I go back with Billy Duffy 40 years, you know. I, oh. A friend of mine called Mick Rossi, who was the guitarist in a punk rock group called Slaughter and the Dogs, oh. uh, still a really good friend of mine. Billy, they were in a band together, and Mick Rossi said to Billy, if you don't come to London, you know, you're never going to make it. So he kind of dragged Billy down to London. That's when I first met him, and that was in, that must have been in 1981, so he was, you know, he hadn't even joined Theatre of Hate at that point. And so, um, yeah, he, um, so I, I, I'd already done Chelsea, Gen X. I was playing with Kim Wilde. So, you know, I was like this successful guitarist and he was like this kid a couple of years younger than me from Manchester. And he was kind of in awe of me. It was really funny. <laughs> 20 years later, he was my boss, you know. That's how it goes. So, uh, James, when did you first uh, learn or when did you first start picking up the guitar? Um... First, when probably when I was about eleven years old, and I had a cheap acoustic guitar, and I learned a few chords, and then, then I put it away for a while, and then a friend of mine at school bought an electric guitar, and he was like, "You've got to buy one, James, so we can be in a band together." So, we went off on the bus to a place in Northwest London called Harlston, and I that's where I bought my first guitar, and that's <laughs> the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, James, as a guitarist, who were your influences? Ah, uh, well, my favourite all-time guitar player is Mick Ronson. Um, not for, because he was technically incredible, but just because he always invented the perfect part for the song. And so that's why it's such an honour for me to, you know, to be in Holy Holy with Tony Visconti and Woody Woodmansey, you know, who's the only surviving spider, because I get to play all Mick Ronson stuff with the people who made the records. Oh. So, I mean, if you listen to the guitar solo on, for example, Life on Mars... It's easy to play, but it's genius to invent because it is so perfect for the song. Um, then other guitar players are like, you know, Jeff Beck, obviously, you know, and then all the all the greats, Paul Kossoff, Jimmy Page, they're all the people that you um they're you know, all the standard people that most guitarists listen to when they're learning to play and growing up. So uh James, let's talk about your soul album. Um when when I met you a few weeks ago, as, t- as T-Bone said. You said something to me that stuck with me that you you kind of point out, you're like, well, I have a soul album. Why aren't you guys talking about that? I apologize. I had no idea you had a soul album. You told me, well, it's, it's brilliant. And you're right. This album is nothing short of, of brilliant. I love how each track is unique and kind of has its own personality. Well, thanks. Yeah. And so, James, you know, kind of get on a, a sad, kind of a sad note, I guess you could say. This album is dedicated to your late brother, David, who yeah. died of, of Pick's disease during the COVID lockdown. And uh, you, you've said that the opening track, The Other Side of the World, the title track, is about him. On the other side of the world, someone I love a lot. I love him with all I got. Yes, I do. Can you tell us how losing him helped form this album? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously it's a really, a real mixed blessing because... I mean, my brother had been seriously ill for a long time. He was younger than me. And, um, you know, I discovered that this Pick's disease, it's actually genetic and runs in my family. So my, it was on my mother's side. So if you have a parent that has it, you have a 50% chance of inheriting it. And if you do inherit it, you die. It's, there's no treatment and it's horrible. You would dream of having cancer instead. But when my brother died, I mean, I was devastated, but... I wrote this, I said to him, he's got three sons who are all grown up, and I said to them that I wanted to write a song about my brother for his funeral. So um, I wrote the song The Other Side of the World, which is because he lived in Australia, which is the other side of the world, and mentally he was on the other side of the world as well because it's like kind of uh, early onset Alzheimer's, the disease that he had. So um, I wrote that song, and then I recorded it, and then I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this properly. And Peter Walsh, if you know who that is, he's a producer, friend of mine. He's done four Gene Loves Jezebel albums. He's done, like, Scott Walker, Simple Minds, Peter Gabriel. He's incredible. And so I sent it to him. and Well, I sent it to Smiley, the drummer in The Alarm, first. He put some real drums on it, and then he sent it to Pete. And the thing is about Pete, you send it to him, and he's got his own studio, and 
it sounds like a demo when you send it to him, but when he, he sends it back with everything he's done, it sounds like a record. I don't know what he does. But so I did that, and Pete did that for me as a favour. And then I said to him, because this is during lockdown in 2020, I said, do you think we could um, record a whole album like this with you know none of us actually being in the same room at the same time? And he said, yeah, I think we could. So, so that was kind of what inspired me to get started. So in a way, writing that song for my brother's funeral is what you know made me decide to make a whole record. And on that record, there's also a few other tracks that I really enjoyed that stood out. Uh, baby, come on. Baby, 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 come on. Take a little love. Take a little love if you want some. Take a little love today. I got a little love if you need some. If you need a little coming your way. When you're feeling sad and lonely. Point it to your head. If that's love, just point it to your head. If that's love, just point it to your head. If that's love, just point it to your head. If that's love. It really stuck with me on this album. Did you have a favorite track recording the album or making this album? Yeah, I think I'm getting over you now is my favorite song I've ever written. I mean, I know it's long, it's like six and a half minutes long, but you said please don't break my heart. You know, there's just something I liked about it. And I like the way, you know, the guitar kind of works at the end. Um, so that's that's probably my favorite track. But it changes all the time, you know. Yeah, and oh, one thing I like. also did like on that album is I like how your guitar kind of takes on its own personality on each song, too, as well. You definitely oh, right. a highlight and a standout. And it doesn't it, it doesn't sound the same on each track. It's unique and different on each one. And I think that's really amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I try and apply whatever I think, you know, guitar wise, whatever I think is going to work um, for the particular track. So um, the track Gotta Find That Feeling is probably my favorite song on the album. You kind of alternate between snarky smoke, spoken words, a funky guitar line and some smooth sax, all with a sense of humor. Just wander around, take it easy. Get that weight off your shoulders. Have a good time. Most of the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. Gotta find that feeling. Yeah, yeah. Gotta find that feeling. Was that a fun song to figure out? Yeah, it was kind of an accident because I had the chorus. I mean, quite often, I don't know how other songwriters work, but I'll have, I have my phone with me at all times. And if I get an idea, I'll just record it in my phone. And so I had that chorus. Um, and um, got to find that feeling. And I thought, well, what am I going to do for the verse? You know, and then I was just I put down some kind of instrumentation, but I couldn't think of a tune or anything. So I thought, I'm just going to like say it. it was in the middle of lockdown when no one was allowed outside or anything. So I thought I'm just going to like talk. talk. And uh, so that's kind of what I did. And then I wasn't sure that I liked it. So I got a friend of mine over to see because I thought he might he had a voice a bit like that and I thought he might do a better job and uh but he was terrible <laughs> so in the end <laughs> I just um I left my vocal on there and uh yeah I mean it's a quirky fun song it's got it's a sense it's got a sense of humor no oh, yeah that's one of the things I like about it so much another thing that I really like about this album and again for our listeners it's called the other side of the world is the variety of the songs on there. I think Steve kind of mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, you go from sneering kind of punk on Ugly Beautiful. I wonder what it's take on everything was. Ugly Beautiful's what it said. To more of a guitar-driven Pink Floyd-like track on New York 10023. Is, is that just something that's in you, that kind of 
difference between the different kind of styles and everything? You just enjoy all the different kinds of types of tracks? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just about who my influences are. I mean, I came out of a punk rock kind of background and I always think of really I started in 1966, 1977 in the punk scene in London and everything. But I always really loved like 70s funk music. I mean, Johnny Guitar Watson is one of my favourite guitar players. And uh, he wrote a song called Superman Lover. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but the lyrics, I mean, there's, there's a, such a sense of humour in there and they're so witty. They call me the Superman Lover. Yeah, but something wrong, something wrong with me to see, something wrong. Um, so I always loved that kind of funk thing. So that, I mean, as well, on my, my first solo album, there's a tune called Give It Up that has a kind of funky edge to it as well, because, you know, I always like those, those kind of funk guitar players. I mean, you know, I think Niall Rogers is an incredible guitar player. And... Um, so, you know, although I've mainly always played Les Pauls and been a rock guitar player, sometimes I will, you know, like pick, pick up a Strat and, you know, play some funky stuff on it. So there's kind of, you know, it's just a mishmash of everything I've ever listened to. You know, we just talked about this a moment ago, but you recorded this album during the COVID lockdown. Uh, you sent uh, your parts, uh, guitar, bass, vocals, I believe, to others so they could add to the song. Was that a challenge? Not really, because, I mean, it's all you can just do it all over the internet. I mean, it's very different because when you're in a, you know, when I've worked with Pete Walsh before, you know, he's in the control room, I'm in the studio, and you get, and, you know, instantly someone, you, you can feed off somebody instantly. Whereas, and he, you know, Pete might say, I think you could do a better solo than that, or how about playing this in the bridge, you know. But when you're doing it all via the internet, you have to send them the files, they have to download them. So there's nothing spontaneous. And then they'll get back to you and say, well, I think maybe this or that, or maybe replace this guitar. So it's not a spontaneous, you know, kind of exercise in the way being in a studio with a producer can be. Because, well, there were a couple of people did actually come to my house, like Henry Badowski, the sax player, uh, who's on Baby Come On. He actually came, because he lives around the corner, he came and played the sax in my studio. But Terry Edwards, who played most of the rest of the sax on the record, he just did it in his studio at home. And that's kind of the way people work now. So, and, I, you know, I really enjoyed it in a, a lot of ways because sometimes when you're in an expensive studio, you get that sense of pressure. Oh, God, this place is costing a £1,000 a day. I'd better, you know get my parts together pretty fast. Uh, but when you're just working at home, which is kind of the way it's going, I think, you know, I do it a lot. With, like, people ask me to play on their record and I just say, send me the tracks and I'll do it in my studio at home. Um, and I really enjoy it because you can just go at your own pace, make your own decisions. And um, so I think, you, yeah, I mean, I've, I enjoyed working like that. And it was, you know, just because of lockdown in a way. But I mean, I was working in my own studio and sending files to people and interact, acting with them over the internet before lockdown and the COVID thing hit anyway. I, I could definitely see the advantages of the way it is turning now to being more kind of individual and everything. But do you miss that kind of camaraderie that you would have if you were all in the studio? Yeah, I mean, that's the downside is, you know, is playing, especially if you're doing it with a band and recording actual backing tracks, you know, you're actually playing live and feeding off each other. And that is part of the chemistry of music that's so great. So obviously you don't get any of that when you're working on your own in your own at home. So you kind of mentioned you were, you could record your own parts, send them off to others to have them add on to the album. Did you have yeah. any uh, special, did you have any guest musicians that want to help join you on this album or on your project? I mean, on my first album, I had more guests because, well, there was no lockdown. <laughs> and I did on this album, I played all the bass. I played a lot of the instruments myself, and Pete Walsh did all the keyboards. Whereas on my first album, you know, Glenn Matlock's on there, Steve Norman from Spandau Ballet played some sax for me on that. But on this one, there was a <clears throat> the core was me, Smiley, and Pete Walsh. And uh, and then I got in, I got in uh, Jessica Lee Morgan sang BBs on one track. That's Tony Visconti's daughter. And uh, Elizabeth Westwood, um, who used to be in the band Westworld and is actually my ex-wife, uh, and her and Tracy Hunter, who's Ian Hunter's daughter, they did a lot of the backing vocals on the record. Um, so, you know, to, there weren't so many guests because it just because I was recording it at home during lockdown. So, um, so those are that's I got a, a friend of mine, Harriet Stubbs, an incredible concert pianist. She just got an OBE actually in the. Queen's list over here. Uh, she played piano on one track, 
um, which is the last track on the album, just like I do. I mean, I've got a few guests, but there's more guests on my first album. I think that's what I'm trying to say. So you did mention, you know, as we talked, you did record this remotely. One thing I did like, I appreciate with your album recorded remotely is you cannot tell. There's been some albums that have come out and you can clearly tell there's a lack of quality or right. it just doesn't lack the production. It lacks the production being recorded remotely. Yeah, I think that's more to do with Peter Walsh than it is to do with me. <laughs> when, I did my first, when I did my first album, you know, I was a bit nervous about doing my first solo album. I mean, I've been in the music industry for 30 years when I made my first solo album. And, um, you know, but I knew if Pete, well, I rang him up. He was living in Germany at the time. And I said, look, will you, if I ring you up, I'm going to record my solo album. Could you give me some advice as I go? And he said, James, I'm producing your record. And I wouldn't let you do it with anyone else. And then he got the plane over to London and we did it together. And um, so I knew because Pete was doing it, even if people hated the songs or whatever, or they thought I couldn't sing. Um, I knew it was going to sound good because everything Pete does just sounds incredible. He hears things normal people don't hear. So. They do sound incredible. And then our listeners, they can get your solo album on your website, right? How can we? How can they get to seek out your music? Yeah, the, if you want the physical CD, the only place you can get it is on my website, which is jamesstevenson.info. But it's on Spotify and you can download it on iTunes and all that stuff as well. We spoke with you in Salt Lake. Uh, when we spoke with you, you said you were looking forward to a nice break. I think you said you were on tour for the last two years and you were looking forward to just taking some time off to relax. I hope you're enjoying that time. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, you know, having the sun. I mean, I actually, I have a love-hate relationship with London, but I'm loving it at the moment. It's the summer here and it's, uh, it's, it's a, I'm having a good time. And, you know, my favourite thing to do is walk on stage and play my guitar. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, I'm sure I'll be, a few things will be, uh, cropping up in my diary before the end of the year <laughs> now, that was my next question is if you could shed any light into maybe what's next or when we can expect to start seeing you again well do you know what there's absolutely nothing in my diary right now because mike peters from the alarm um he had i don't know if you know he's he's a leukemia sufferer so even though he's in and then when we were out on the road uh here in the uk he got pneumonia so everything in the alarms diary got cancelled and his doctor said he had to have at least six months of doing nothing, which Mike is one of those people who doesn't like to do nothing, uh, you know. Yeah. He's, yeah. Got nothing going on right now. You know, let's, let's, let's go back to, uh, you know, Gene Loves Jezebel and The Alarm. How did you come about to be in both bands? Oh, well, you know, every band you join, it's a different story. Um, with Gene Loves Jezebel, it was in 1985 and I had the same manager. And they were, Gene Love says, well, I, did, I was playing with Steve New, who was the guitar player in The Rich Kids. He was actually the guy that wrote Point It To Your Head that's on my new album. Oh. I recorded that kind of as a tribute to Steve because I love that guy. He, he was died. He was only 50 as well, about 10 years ago. Uh, he was a great guitar player. Um, but anyway, I was playing with him and we had the same manager as Gene Love says, well, and they just started their first American tour. And... Um, their guitarist had a massive nervous breakdown and just couldn't go on with the tour. In fact, Jay said to me, the first inkling he got that Ian, the, my, the previous guitarist, wasn't well, is they'd stopped in a truck stop. I mean, it sounds funny now, but they stopped in a truck stop and Jay said that Ian just ran off into the woods. <laughs> you know? so I was like, uh-oh. Anyway, so Jerry, our manager, he primed me and said, look, this is going really badly. Pacino says, in America, you might have to go out and save this tour. And then literally two days later, he said, you're going to New York tomorrow. So I got on a plane, didn't know any of the guys, got into rehearsals and just learned the songs. We went straight out onto a two-month uh, American tour. So that's how that happened. And then with... um. The Alarm, well, it was Mike Peters wasn't using the Alarm name when I first started doing it. He'd done an album. Um, he had a band called Colour Sound with Billy Duffy. Oh. Uh, and they'd made this album. And Mike was going out to promote his solo album, which was called Rise. And he asked Billy if um, he'd play guitar on this tour. And I, Billy either couldn't or he didn't want to or for whatever reason. But Billy, rec I'd never met Mike Peters, but Billy recommended to him that he speak, speak to me. So I spoke to Mike and then we met up and got on. And then he said, yeah, just, do you want to do this tour? And I said, yeah, okay, great. 
And then I've been doing that now for 23 years. It's nice to have friends in high places, huh? <laughs> As they say. So, uh, you know, you kind of already alluded to this, but I just want to bring it up real quick again. Uh, with the brand new album out from The Alarm, Omega, any news, advanced news that you can spill on an upcoming tour, or are we going to be waiting a little while? I think you might be waiting until next year for The Alarm. I mean, like I said, you know, Mike's had pneumonia. He's recovering now, but it's been quite a slow recovery. And uh, he has to be careful because he has leukemia anyway. So, um, and his doctors, he's literally under doctor's orders to have, you know, the next six months off. So, you know, Gene loves Jezebel, you know, we've just done those dates in the US, but you just never know what's what I love about this business. You just never know what is around the corner. And with Gene loves Jezebel, I think your guys' last album was in 2018. Any ideas started about maybe another album coming out in the next year or so? Do you know what, Pete? Not really. I mean, we have been messing around and Pete, Rizzo, bass players, like comes up with really, really great songs. Him and Jay have done a lot of writing together. Um, so we have been sort of bashed a few things out in in sound checks and stuff. So, you know, yeah, there probably will be another Gene of Jezebel album, but it's probably going to be 2023. Right. OK. Well, James, you know, it's been an absolute thrill to meet you back in May and uh, and also the same a thrill to have you on the show with us. We we love we both really enjoy the new album. There's so much variety to it. Uh, again, you can get that on your website. Now, will you say that website again to purchase the album? James www.jamesstevenson.info. Dot info. Perfect. And then also, as you mentioned, you can get that music on the different uh, service providers, whether it's Spotify or iTunes, a number of different places. We would recommend it. You know, uh, it's nice to see that uh, an album come out that that has uh, not only a sense of humor, but a lot of different musical styles on it. And so, again, James, thank you so much for being with us today. And we wish you the very best. And we hope to see you on the road pretty soon. Thank you. And thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me as well.